I'm so sorry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to the 38th Sharjah International Book Fair. I'm glad to welcome you to the author session today with Mr. Vikram Seth, a passionate novelist and poet. We hope that you have an engaging session with us this evening. But before that, a little bit about the largest book fair in the world. The theme for this year is Open Books, Open Minds. And with that, I now call upon the principal of the Millennium School Dubai, Ms. Ambika Gulati, to welcome the gathering. And welcome to the 38th edition of the Sharjah International Book Fair. And especially to this evening that we've all been waiting for, an evening with Mr. Vikram Sait. To moderate this session this evening, we have Ms. Anjana Shankar, a prominent figure in UAE's media industry. Ms. Shankar writes prolifically on uh, global conflicts, migration, natural disasters, and crisis, and refugee crisis. Put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome Ms. Shankar. Everyone, it's nice to see a packed audience again, and uh, I was so glad to see that there's more traffic inside the Sharjah Book Fair venue than it is on the Sharjah roads. <laughs> Uh, talking about traffic jams, uh, I think Vikram got a taste of it. So let me begin asking you this. What is worse, a traffic jam, getting trapped in a traffic jam, or writer's block? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what's your next question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have another question. Talking about writer's block, it brings me to a question that I'm sure which is on everybody's lips. I'm sure you have been pushed to a point of getting annoyed by this question, but I still have to ask this question, where is a suitable girl? Um, she's gestating slowly. Um, a suitable girl is a sequel to a suitable boy, which I avoided trying to write um, after a suitable boy came out. And some 25 years later, I had the idea of of writing it, but with uh, a temporal gap of 60 years. So a suitable boy is set in the 50s, and a suitable girl is set roughly in the present. Um, the protagonist of that book, um, Lata, was 20 at that time, and now she'd be about 80. So, uh, so she'll take her time to, to be born or reborn, let's put it that way. Okay, Vikram, you avoid a question, it will keep coming back to you. So I've avoided two questions now. <laughs> right. Maybe so, third time. Yeah, back third in. time. Let, I'm not going to give up. You know, you have spoken about writer's block. How distressing was it as a, an author, especially a successful one at that? Well, um, I wasn't really an author in the first instance. I, my background was at school, you know, physics, pure maths, applied maths at university, politics, philosophy, demography, economics. So I stumbled into being an author. I, I always wrote poetry, but you can't make a living from poetry. So it was when I started writing novels that I finally found that I could be a professional author. Um, the first novel I wrote, The Golden Gate, came out very quickly. It was like the height of inspiration because I was supposed to be doing my economics dissertation. And uh, perhaps because of that, uh, the Golden Gate, um, since it was subversive to my thesis, uh, came out quickly and smoothly. But A Suitable Boy it took me seven or eight years to write and a couple of years to recover from. So that took much longer. Um, it was during the course of that that I realized what writer's block was because um, there was a period of about eight months, nine months when I simply got no ideas at all. I was th thinking of giving up writing the book. It was distressing, but on the other hand, I, I, I usually distract myself by doing other stuff. So while I couldn't write A Suitable Boy, I wrote a book of poems called Beastly Tales uh, for, for children. Beastly Tales uh, from here and there. Animal fables in verse. So if this doesn't work, that works. And if nothing works, nowadays I take to, as I explained before, Candy Crush. That's, that's my displacement activity these days. 
I think, you know, when you talk about writer's block, writer's block and procrastination, I don't know whether they are, uh, you know, cousins. Uh, we know Vikram Seth, or most of the people know him as a, as a novelist, as a poet. But Vikram, you are also a paintist, a calligrapher, a musician, a linguist, a dreamer, lover, loner. Did I miss anything? <laughs> yes. Not, so, that, not that you could be a lover if you're completely a loner, um, or that you could be, or that you could write a fat book uh, while dreaming the whole time. But a combination of things. But yeah. all those things that you dabbled with, or you know, you took interest. Is yeah. that was that your way of, you know, we procrastinate by checking Facebook. Or was that your way of procrastinating? I don't think it was. A, uh, it was deliberate. When things uh, swim into my ken, when I become interested in them then I, uh, rather than let them float by, I do tend to grab them, even if it's distracting. For example, take uh, writing The Golden Gate. Now, obviously, my parents would rather, and most of my friends would rather, that I have completed my PhD in economics. I spent so many years doing it that it seemed a, a bit of a silly thing to do to suddenly rush off after something else. But I couldn't tell the muse go away, let me finish my dissertation until I become Dr. Sate, then please come back. The muse would have deserted me. And, 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 I, and I would deserve to have been deserted by the muse. I think you just have to take things and, and, and go with them. But it's not always that I procrastinate because um, of some other distraction. Sometimes just because I... Well, there's a poem I wrote about about, about not exactly procrastination, but the inability to do anything. And um, it's called Some Days, Sometimes. Uh, I wish I could remember. Oh, yeah. It's a poem about, um, about not being able to get out of bed, but I can't remember what the title is, uh, what, the, what, the, what the first line is. Um, shared Ground. Can't. Thank you. That's, uh, that's helpful. <laughs> can't. The one that you said, you can't get out of Quite right. So here we are, can't, 589. Thank you for that. Um, I can never remember the names of my characters or titles of my poems. Can't. I feel I simply can't get out of bed. I shiver and procrastinate and stare. I'll press the reset button in my head. I hate my work, but I'm in the red. I'd quit it all if I could live on air. I find I simply can't get out of bed. My joints have rusted and my brain is lead. I drank too much last night, but now I swear I'll press the reset button in my head. My love has gone. What do I have instead? Hot water bottle, God, and teddy bear. I find I simply can't get out of bed. The dreams I dreamt have filled my soul with dread. The world is mad, there's darkness everywhere. I'll press the reset button in my head. Who'll kiss my tears away or earn my bread? Who'll reach the clothes hung on that distant chair? I must, I simply must get out of bed and press that reset button in my head. So sometimes it's just the inability to do anything, rather than the wish to do something else. Okay, Vikram, you mentioned about economics, your PhD in economics, and how you ditched economics. Do you regret that in hindsight? I think it, this is a time when our country badly needs some good economists. It needs a good economist. I'm not sure I would have filled that particular criterion. Um, I spent many years, I think I spent 15 years of my life studying or being an economist or whatever. And one of the things you learn as an economist is that sunk costs are sunk costs. And um, it's sort of no, no use crying over milk that's already drunk or spilt or, 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 or congealed or whatever. The um, other thing is, of course, which is similar to it, which is uh, 
the opportunity costs of, of one's time. And uh, I realized that the opportunity costs, the costs of the alternative foregone, were becoming far too, far too high, let's say. Uh, I'd much rather just write poetry than fritter away my time doing economics. It enters my books, though. For example, A Suitable Boy has lots of um, an, an, an understanding of economics. So in my books, it's not just love and feelings and all that. There's also something about politics, about economics, about the macro world, not just the micro world. All right. You know, there's another interesting thing that I found out about Vikram is uh, he has kept away from social media. Uh, and uh, my question is, see, when you wrote A Suitable Boy, I mean, there was no social media. It was not even as part of our figment of our imagination. True. But now, see, you have managed to keep away, but your characters in The Suitable Girl, are they, you know, connecting on Facebook, dating on Tinder, chatting on WhatsApp? What are they doing? Yes, some of them are. Some of them are. Right? But, but then it's a very funny thing. For example, in this book, sorry, in A Suitable Boy, there's a character who's a courtesan, uh, the wife. And I had to do research into that because by that time, for a start, they didn't exist in India. Um, at that time, it sort of dispersed into, yeah. Um, and so now I'm doing research in a different way, researching into the future rather than into the past through younger people. I, I have 18-year-old consultants and so on, or oh, I, I try to pick their brains and find out what Tinder and Grindr and, and Shadi.com and all these things are, which, you know, uh, and even Twitter. Someone told me I had a Twitter account. Then I remembered, yes, a friend set up a twi Twitter account for me. Last time I checked, you, are, you have 3,469 followers. Yeah. You know, I haven't looked at it for 15 years, 10 years. I haven't contributed to it. Some, someone is obviously running it, but I don't know. And uh, similarly, I have a, a Facebook account, but again, I don't bother with it. So I'm uh, happy. I mean, just imagine, you wake up. In the old days, you had snail mail. You'd look at your mail, it would come once, possibly twice a day, and you'd look at it, or maybe you'd just let it lie. Now there's LinkedIn and Instagram and all the things that you mentioned. One just simply, I don't even have time, even with my email, I sometimes leave it for days on end. Yeah. Yeah. But you're there for your characters. So I'm there for my characters, yeah, sure. I mean, you can't write about the young without writing about these things. Uh, you know, talking about char characters, you know, when you, when you sit down to write them or, you know, to, 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 to discover the intricacies of, of, your, mm. of your characters, as you mentioned earlier, they are definitely influenced by, at a macro level and micro level, all the socio-political changes that, that's happening around them, and it's set in, in, in India. So how does that influence your writing? How, how has it evolved in the last 25, 26 years, when, when you're writing again, in the same milieu? I'm sorry, I was listening to the child. <laughs> I was a bit distracted. I was, I was asking, uh, in all, this, all the socio-political changes that has been happening around, mm. or happening currently, and the milieu that you're writing in, which is the current India, how, how is it influencing the way you write? How has it changed the way you, way you write? I think it's changed the content of what I write. I, and to some extent, um, more things change, the more they remain the same. Um, for example, I mentioned, funnily enough, I mentioned the Babri Masjid in this book long before it was destroyed, but while it was still a subject of, uh, of contention. Um, and now we're in times when, you know, it's again, uh, or it's become a subject again. Many other things like the position of women, the position of uh, farmers versus the urban people, the question of caste, the question of language, many of these things are constant themes in India uh, and possibly in the whole of the subcontinent. But I never take up subjects unless they are intrinsic to the lives of the characters themselves. 
Otherwise, it would seem too much like preaching or, or, or writing a tract. Whereas these are novels, you know, they shouldn't smell of research. They shouldn't smell of too didactic uh, an approach. People have to be interested in the characters. They should want to turn the pages. If somehow in between these pages, a little bit of my philosophy of life comes out, that's fine, but I can't inject it into the book in too obvious a way. And also have to understand people on different sides of the divide. For example, there may be someone who's very liberal, but there may be someone who's quite illiberal, but has a strong on, and honest belief in their views. And I have to explain things from their point of view, not just Mahesh Kapoor, but also Ellen Agarwal. Yeah. You know, talking about intolerance, uh, you have spoken about intolerance. A lot of writers have come out and spoken about the shrinking, uh, you know, creative space, uh, you know, the stifling of free speech in India. As an author, what do you feel about it? Well, I feel it's a, a terrible, terrible pity. I mean, what makes us Indian to some extent is the fact that we embrace our differences, that we don't suddenly feel defensive uh, about speaking our minds, and, and the, the danger that is, that, that's occurred, not just the pity, but the danger of it is that, you know, writers are being killed for what they say, for the thoughts they have, journalists, it's a very dangerous profession, journalism now, uh, many more people are killed in India than in almost any other country, um, not just because of um, politicians, but also because of uh, local hoodlums, partly because of local business interests. Uh, it's not, it's not a, uh, you know, I don't think, I think life is pretty risky in many ways if you, if you speak out. And also, uh, you know, in my case, okay, I'm a fairly well-known writer, but people who are not that well-known don't even necessarily have the protections that I can expect through being able to get my point of view across. Um, and, um, and I think particularly if you write, say, in, uh, not in English, but in, say, Hindi or Malayalam or other languages, you know, you're, you're more at risk and also the rewards are smaller. Yeah. How, for example, can you become a best-selling writer? How can you make a living properly uh, as a novelist, for example, unless you're translated into English or, and so on. And there's very little translation that's going on into other Indian languages from, say, well, I remember reading Shankar's Chorangi many, many years ago, 25 years ago in Hindi. It was a book written in Bengali. And only in the last 10 years has it been translated into English. That's a great pity, you know. There are wonderful Indian writers in other languages, but we can't all read them. Um, I mean, I'll come back to the I'm sorry, I've moved from the question of risk. Uh, and, and lack of freedom of speech to a, an economic question. But they are intertwined as well. All right. I'll come back to the translation point later. But, you know, if the creative landscape, if the, if the, if the writer's, uh, you know, landscape is shrinking, do you think a lot of writers are consciously or uh, otherwise self-censoring what they write? I fear they are. I fear they are. Um, you know, I, I, I personally refuse to. But then, as I say, okay, I'm already fairly established. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge pity. Um, but you know, certain writers, I suppose you could say, somehow get their thoughts through nonetheless. For example, the writer without whom I would have been, would not have been a writer, Pushkin, Alexander Pushkin. He lived in Tsarist times in Russia when there was an actual official censor. And you find that many of his stanzas, even in his great masterpiece, uh, Eugene Onegin, they're missing from the poem. Well, probably because the censor got it then. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a very, it's not a very, I, I'm not too clear in my mind uh, about this idea that oh, well, uh, genius and courage will always break forth. No, I think there can be certain circumstances in which they can be stymied. You know, it, it's now that writers have kept quiet about it. 
you know, we have seen a lot of protests, as they call it, that was an award wopsy gang, you know, who protested by giving back their awards. But if I remember right, you did not. So do you think that that is an ineffective form of protest by writers or they should protest by writing, not by returning awards? What is your take? I think it depends upon the, I'll, I'll address this question about why I didn't, um, but I think it depends upon the personality of the writers. Some are more uh, overtly engaged with uh, the world and with protesting or with political uh, views. Because writers are citizens, just as anyone else is. And they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Other people may be just as engaged with the world and feel just as deeply, but feel that, the, that their writing is their conduit to, um, to expression and to activism, if you can call it that or to influencing people one way or another. Now, it's funny about this thing that you mentioned. I really admire the people who did um, participate in, in that. But I thought that the Sahitya Academy, which is a great institution founded by people like Nehru and Radhakrishnan and so on, and has a great tradition of, uh, of freedom of thought, um, that I, I would when they, when they asked me whether I would uh, protest or not, I said I would speak out against what had happened, uh, against the fact that they hadn't spoken against the murders of these uh, uh, great writers. And that if, if I found that they did not, then I would return. Uh, but you see, that way, if you just, there was some sort of leverage. Uh, before the, the meeting that they called, two months in advance of their regular meeting, at which they actually did speak out very strongly about this. I'm not saying that I had any particular effect, but if you just immediately protest, um, when lots of other people, courageous people have done it, then to that extent, there's no incentive for them to, to change. So that was my view of it. And had they, for example, not made a courageous stand, which they did make, and spoken out against the murders and so on and so forth, then yes, I would have. I, I stated very clearly that I was going to. Okay. Uh, Vikram, you have, you know, lived, you're, you're currently, I understand, living in UK. Yes. But you maintain very close ties with India. Yes, you I live in both, actually. And my father's now, you know, in his 90s. And uh, I like to spend as much time as possible with him. He's very good company. Um, perhaps and I shouldn't mention it in, in Sharjah, but this is the time of day when we have a a scotch and soda uh, together. <laughs> and uh, we, we enjoy both happiness and tolerance, um, both of which are ministries in Sharjah. Which, uh, did, did you know that there's a ministry of tolerance here and a ministry, ministry of happiness? Yeah. And what was your suggestion? He, he I think suggest most countries should have that. I think yeah. we sorely need one. We sorely need both <laughs> in India. And you wanted to have a ministry of laziness. Yes, I, 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 I wanted to have it, but it was an idle thought. I don't think I would have enough energy to actually establish it. And anyone whom I appointed, if they came to work, they'd promptly be sacked. Yeah, coming back to my question about you know, staying in between India and UK, mm. does that give you a better perspective in terms of you can impassionately view and understand and analyze what is happening in India, where you are on the threshold, you're not here or not there. Yes, probably. Does that give you a more of a, an objective view about things? Yes and no. I mean, it requires, I mean, if you haven't lived outside your country to some extent, you might say, well, you don't get a very objective view of it. But again, go back to Pushkin. Pushkin never left Russia, but he, he had a wonderful insight into, into it. I don't think that if, say, uh, you know, uh, Surdas or Tulsidas or Tagore or Ghaleb or whatever, you know, they traveled a bit within India, but it doesn't mean that you have to have that. Shakespeare, it's not very obvious that he left England. So I don't think that, I, 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 it, again, it, it depends upon your, your way of understanding the world. Yes, it's a bit of an advantage, but it's a bit of a disadvantage as well. You can feel uprooted. So I have no view on that. And also, here's something else. I don't think writers should always be expected to have a view on everything. 
People always ask me, so this has happened in politics. Now, what is your view on this? And I think, well, I mean, I have views like every citizen has a view. And, and I think there's no more, there's no, I mean, people do say that writers have a specific duty. I think writers have a specific duty to be honest within their books. Um, but they, they don't always have to have views on things. And sometimes when I feel very strongly about something, uh, like what happened in 1992 in the Babri Masjid, I spoke out about it, front page ad, which I signed uh, to, or when, what happened in Tiananmen, the firing on the square, I talked about that, about apartheid and so on. But there's certain things that I, I just think, well, just keep your powder dry. Okay. Let's get okay. back to writer's block now. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> How about writer's cramp? I had that too uh, when I was writing the fat book. Um, I just couldn't write. I couldn't even lift a pen at a certain stage. Okay. Um, Vikram, you know, in your suitable girl, a suitable boy, mm. suitable girl and two lives, you know, one subject that you have dealt with in very detail is family, marriage, family yeah. ties. So what is that uh, keeps you coming back? brings you, you know, back to that particular subject. Why are you <coughs> obsessed with that? I'm not obsessed. I mean, everyone loves their family and... Okay. Uh, but you choose... For example, in, 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 in um, uh, An Equal Music, which is set in England and is set around a string quartet, there's not very much family in it. It's all about passionate love and darkness of love and the confusion of love and all that stuff. Whereas in A, in a Suitable Boy, there's lots about the family. In um, two lives, two lives. There's a lot about the family. In the Golden Gate, there isn't all that much. There is some. So it's not. But you know, you can't write about India without writing about the family. I mean, that that's virtually impossible. I mean, family, caste, clans. You know, this is just the 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 milieu in which we live. It's, we can't breathe without you know. Yeah. That, that's so true. Yeah. Uh, you know, there is a close correlation between <clears throat> what you write and where you are geographically. Like when you wrote yes. The Suitable Boy, you were in India spending time with your family, mm. you were in Delhi. That's true. And I think with Golden Gate, you were again in California, you were, you were in the US. Yes, And that's then when you, when you traveled across Tibet, Nepal, you, you came out with your travelogue. Mm. So, what is the connection? Do you, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to ask that question. Is there another place that you actually want to go and write about it? If that one place is, what is, what, what is that? Well, with respect to your first comment, um, I do think that um, to be surrounded by the speech patterns, by the feelings, by the smells, by the noises, etc., of the place is important. Because after all, you are your characters. You are all your characters. You are in the voice of every everyone from the courtesan to the politician to the farmer to the to the uh, to the to the dog vicious dog cuddles so you have to be all of them um, so to, and also i think that if something does not succeed in convincing the people about whom you're writing then it doesn't matter how successful it is elsewhere it's failed to my mind as an artistic entity so that's uh, that's my, my feeling about it as for whether I really want to write about any other place, I think you need to know the place very well before writing about it. And I can't say that I know any places really well other than India, which I've lived longer in than all the other countries put together, um, England, which I've spent about 10 years in America, where California specifically where I spent 10 years, and in China, where I spent a couple of years. But in China, I don't think I could write fiction about it. Because I think you need to have lived two or three, um, or four or five cycles, so to speak, of the seasons. Because otherwise, you can't tell what happened that year by chance, and what happens every year, and things that are variations of that annual cycle. So, no, I don't think so. Maybe I should take up magic realism and write in, uh, in, in some country entirely of my, some fictive country entirely of my own making. 
Now, don't you think I should enter UAE and uh, let some people from the audience ask questions? Yes. Uh, we, we will have a, you know, session where we are opening the floor okay. for questions. Uh, so, but, and I'll wrap up with, with one last question. Uh, I'm sorry. Just... Actually, while you're fumbling with your notes, I, I should explain to the audience the audience, um, I, it's, it's by way of apology uh, on all our behalfs. Um, many of you have been waiting here for a long time before I arrived. There's a reason for this. What happened was that on, in the book itself, it was a certain time was printed, 8.30. And on other notices, 7.30 was printed. Um, so rather than perform at 7.30 and then send people who came at 830 away. It was decided, together with a little bit of help from the Shah, from the Sharjah and Dubai traffic, that uh, we'd, we'd push it towards this end. So many apologies for those who, who had to wait. And thank you for your tolerance. So Vikram, before we uh, throw open uh, the yeah. floor for questions, could you tell our audience a little bit about you know, your love for calligraphy, uh, especially Chinese calligraphy, and how did you uh, how did you get hooked on to that? Was it well, part of your travel? Um, when I was in China, I wrote exactly as most Chinese people write with a ball pen. But later when I went back to, in fact, at that time I hadn't even translated much classical Chinese poetry. Then around the time of Tiananmen, uh, I, I became very involved with thinking about China, and particularly the tradition that the Chinese have of turning in times of difficulty or sorrow to their poetry. And uh, particularly their classical poets, uh, the eighth century classical poets like Du Fu and Li Bai and so on. So that's when I translated their poetry. And then later I thought, well, when they wrote the poetry, they didn't write it with a ball pen, they wrote it with a brush. And so I became involved with Chinese calligraphy. At that time, I was in London, and I found a wonderful um, uh, uh, calligrapher who, uh, who taught me, uh, um, for, for about a month, he only taught me dots. And, and, and then um, slowly, I was taken through the various strokes and finally into a, a freedom of expression. Chinese poetry. Um, I was, I, I was um, uh, you talked about music. I wrote a, a, a book uh, with four uh, libretti in it, which was set to music. And uh, the publishers asked me whether I'd illustrate it with a bit of calligraphy. And so the first year out of four was set in, in, in China. In the first year, it was Chinese which was a, a poetry, poetry from a, a wonderful poet called, called Du Fu. And the poem from which these uh, lines comes is, um, where is it? Three Chinese poets. Um, hmm. I should have brought the individual books, but I... They put it together collected poems, and as a result, I've stuck with this. The Humble Administrator's Garden, uh, Live Oak, All Who Sleep Tonight. Where are my Chinese poets? Oh, yeah, they are. So this is Du Fu. It's an eight-line poem. I can't believe it. Oh, here we are. He is here. Yes, this is it. Um, it's called Spring Scene in Time of War. It's an eight-line poem. Uh, du Fu was separated from his family at the time of a, a great ci uh, civil war in China uh, in the 760s. And in fact, uh, one of his children died of starvation. There was a lot of famine. Um, 
and this is what he writes. The state lies ruined. Hills and streams survive. Spring in the city, grass and leaves now thrive. Moved by the times, the flowers shed their dew. The birds seem startled. They hate parting too. The steady beacon fires are three months old. A word from home is worth a ton of gold. I scratch my white hair, which has grown so thin, it soon won't let me stick my hat pin in. So these two lines are the steady... What it says over here is, this is um, beacon fire connects three months. House, home letter worth 10,000 gold. So that's how it goes. It's one syllable. Feng Huo Lian San Yue. Jia Shu Di Wan Jin. So it's each, each character is one syllable. You can see how uneconomical English is in comparison. Instead of saying ta 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 ta, I say the steady beacon fires are three months old. Uh, uh, uh. I can't remember. A word from home is worth a ton of gold, and so on. So, but this is, so anyway, once I learned how to do this, then I, I, Chinese calligraphy is done with a brush. It's absolutely obsessive. Once you get into it, I think I must have spent years doing calligraphy. And then at the side, I, I've written what's known as a colophon, which is my name, Xie Bin Lang. Xie is for Sate. Bin Lang is the closest they can get to Vikram. Shu Yu Chuo Shui Zhuang which I wrote in Autumn Waters Manor, which is the name of my Chinese calligraphy teacher gave my English house that name because it's on a river. Now, I noticed that in the Chinese calligraphy, you've got to have your name. Whereas later, um, in, uh, in the, uh, when I did the Arabic uh, calligraphy in my fourth year, that was with my other, my calligraphy teacher, Nassar Mansur, who's a, um, a great uh, student of Hassan Chalabi, a great uh, Turkish uh, calligrapher. That year, I ran out of ideas, so I decided to uh, have seven elements. Earth, air, fire, water, and then we have space as well in India. And the Chinese have fire, water, earth, metal, and wood. So those seven elements all together, earth, air, fire, water, space, metal, and wood, I tried to combine them into a sort of mandala and use the hamzas and the three dots for khashab in a way that, so you can see ma and nar and hava. And with metal, ma'adhan, I sort of twiddled it around. And it was in 2011, so I was able to use 1, 4, 3, 2, the first four <laughs> integers. And then finally, the, the nuktas or the dots form the seven stars of the, of the great bear, which you can see. Like the night sky, you know, looking through bars of the night sky. And, and south is north over here. So, it, it, it became a kind of obsession. I don't think, uh, you know, if... It, and the other two are just uh, things uh, uh, in... Uh, just ordinary handwriting in Hindi and in English based on poems that I either translated or, or, or wrote. That's from Surdas. Um, I think we leave this one or this one? Which one should we leave on? This one. This one. Fine, we leave that one on. My teacher wouldn't be too pleased. He believes in sort of... Pure purity and classicism. And I asked him, should I sign it? And he said, no, don't. Until you've got your ijaza or your teaching credentials, you, you shouldn't sign it. So it's the opposite view in the Arab, uh, Arabic calligraphy uh, um, uh, environment from the Chinese calligraphy environment where if you don't sign it, then it's not complete. Interesting. Um, maybe at the very end, I'll read one of the poems or one or two of the poems that I wrote on the seven elements, which is why I had to illustrate um, the libretti with, with this. Isn't that fascinating? I hope you will excuse me for 
holding on to the Q&A session for five minutes sure. because this was, I, I really wanted you to see it. Good evening, sir. If you're feeling my shy, name, just stay okay. where you are. <laughs> my, name is, my name is Ria and I wanted to ask you, yes. um, what is your inspiration behind writing satire as your style of writing? Sorry, what's the inspiration behind writing what? Behind writing satire. Oh, satire. Oh, satire. As, your stu as your style of writing. Yes. Well, satire, many of my poems are not satirical, they're fairly serious or melancholy sometimes or humorous. But satirical is, is usually when you're you know, making fun of uh, either a political situation. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Um, well, I love the poetry, for example, of, uh, of uh, Alexander Pope, who is often very satirical about the life and culture of his times. Um, if you read uh, uh, Ghalib's letters, for example, he's quite you know, humorous about his times. Uh, not his poetry so much, but his letters. Um, Pushkin is quite satirical. It's just, it's just a, ple a pleasure in, in commenting on the passing scene. Um, so that, that's, that's my inspiration for writing, writing satire. So you think that social messages are better portrayed via satire? Um, no, not necessarily. For example, if something you know, uh, tragic happens, you can write very directly about it as well, uh, by way of a story or by way of a, a, a poem. But sometimes you feel that it's worth having a slightly lighter touch uh, you can convince people better, and also you may be in the mood to treat a subject in a certain way. Okay. Sometimes you can treat the same subject satirically and seriously uh, in, di in completely different poems. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I'll take the hand that's the most beautiful. <laughs> no, fine. Uh, any hand, any hand will do. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I am Chidambaram. My question is regarding Corpus Christi College. Corpus Christi College, where you have studied. Oh, Corpus Christi College, yes. I am doing, I am planning to do research on Dr. I mean, Christopher Marlowe, yes. who had studied in Corpus Christi College but 500 years before, in the 16th century. Was he Corpus Cambridge or? A Corpus Christi College. In Cambridge or in Oxford? Ah, uh, well, uh, that I don't know. Yes. But uh, that's why I was wondering whether uh, you know him because you are also a poet. Well, certainly. Writer. I mean, one, one knows of Christopher Marlowe and he, he, died, he died very young at the age of 26 or yeah, something. But in, no, a, in, a, in, a, in a fight in a pub or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but he was a wonderful. He wrote six plays. Great plays. Great Two plays. or three of them are really great plays. Unfortunately, in the whole book, uh, book fair, I did not see find a book of Christopher Marlowe. Uh, I, I'm afraid I have no inside knowledge and on, so on the I was just wondering whether uh, you had uh, visited the literature department there in Christopher Christi. Uh, Corpus Remember, Christi when I was at Oxford, when I was at, uh, uh, at Corpus Christi College, I was an economist. So literature was, you know, I liked reading it, but I didn't study it. Okay. In fact, I've never studied literature. I'm not even allowed to teach it because, after all, I, I, I don't have any qualifications in literature. Except honorary qualifications. Um, Thank you. Yes. Yeah. There's a beautiful hand out there. A beautiful hand. Yep. Thank you, sir. I sure. just want to know which, what is, like, I want your personal opinion. Which, what is more satisfying, writing poetry or story? Because I'm a budding writer. Sorry, you're a poetry writer? I, yes, I write poetry and yeah. really, you know, enjoy that. So well, I just I, want I, to know I, your yeah. opinion about it. I'm on your side. I became a novelist by mistake. <laughs> uh, I became a novelist by mistake. Uh, I, I always wrote poetry, even when I was you know, an economist or whatever. But what happened was that, and I thought novels are too difficult and too complex and also too loose and unsatisfactory somehow. With poem, okay, you've written the stanza, it's rhymed, it's connected. You can't change a word. It's absolutely there. With a, a paragraph in a novel, I can change a sentence. I can, it's not quite as uh, inevitable, let's put it yeah, that Yeah, it's brief and precise. I think uh, I knew it. I just wanted to hear that from you. Thank you. But what happened was that 
Um, I, I, I was so uh, affected by Pushkin's novel in verse, Eugene Onegin, that I decided to write a novel in verse set in San Francisco, which I was at Stanford at that time. And as a result of writing that novel in verse, which is the first bit of fiction I'd ever written, I realized I could create characters and environments and atmosphere and tones and themes. And so I, it was my ford, it was my stepping stone or my set of stepping stones towards fiction. So after having written that, I was able to go home to India and write A Suitable Boy because now I knew something about novel writing. Yeah, Through, I, sorry. Sorry, is this like the, you are writing your own story, is it too much of hard work? Um, okay, I'll repeat the question because you don't have the mic. Is it too much of hard work when you're writing uh, uh, a novel? A okay. novel? Um, no, they're equal, they're different. But I don't get quite as obsessed uh, when you're writing a novel because it's over a very long period of time. Whereas with the poem, it's like a concentrated laser-like beam of light, which is sort of, you know, on your forehead the whole time or focused on your heart the whole time. So. Thank you. Uh, there's a question there on the left side. Okay. Yeah, there, on the left. By the way, if someone over here has been raising their hand for a long time, stand up and start shouting in protest. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, the question was, if I were to be remembered by just one of my works, Change. which one would it be and why? Yes. Um, today's Friday, right? Yes. So it'll probably be a suitable boy, but tomorrow it would be a... Look, I probably would say there's, a, there's one poem of, my, of mine which people seem to have taken to their hearts and uh, found it apparently on notice boards and you know, um, mental hospitals, um, by people's bedsides, uh, all sorts of things. Like that. That's a poem called All You Who Sleep Tonight, yes. which uh, is eight lines long and probably will last longer yeah. than this 1500 page book. <laughs> so that poem goes, uh, All you who sleep tonight, far from the ones you love, no hand to left or right, and emptiness above, know that you aren't alone. The whole world shares your tears, some for two nights or one, and some for all their years. Uh, I'm Amok, and my question is that uh, uh, how do you prepare or plan your book or novel before starting to write it? First, Amok, it's very important to be very, very, very lazy. <laughs> Lie flat on your bed or on the floor. I, I can demonstrate if you like. And then just stare at the ceiling. Because these characters, the novel characters don't exist. You've got to pull them out from somewhere. Um, I find it quite useful to not go out in the evenings and to wake up at 3 or 4 in the morning and just lie in bed and dream. Because real people are too real. You know, yeah. if I hear my mother's keys jangling or sounds on the road outside, you know, then they'll disturb you. Someone saying, have you had your you know, breakfast? So if you just lie there for a few hours and just wool gather for a while, then after a while, you should be quite active in two different ways, structuring it and also finding out from people what that world is really like. Like I mentioned about the courtesan or Anjana mentioned about finding out about, about um, Tinder and things like that. So you have to find out about the actual world or the economics of shoemaking or something like that. So there's a little hard work involved there, then to organize it and then write and then, very important, revise. So that covers a lot of it. And then finally, um, promote it because you have to after your publishers. Have, and then lie back on your bed again because you'll be exhausted <laughs> and sleep for about a year till the next idea comes along. Thank you, sir. Um, hi, sir. Uh, I'm Lalita. Lalita? 
Yeah. Uh, so first off, I admire your work. And uh, my first exposure to your work was when I was much younger and I read uh, Frog in the Nightingale. Oh, right. So um, I really appreciated how you uh, stayed away from the sugar-coated denouement, which was the cliche, and how you didn't underestimate the emotional uh, intellect that could actually be there in a middle grader. Um, so, but my question is, um, yes. so actually been inspired by greats such as yourself. I'm a writer as well. Right. And uh, my second book, Diamond Discovery, actually got published recently, uh, earlier this year. Congratulations. Well done. Uh, uh, sir, I just wanted to ask you, sure. uh, sir, what advice would you give to a new writer such as myself just stepping into this ocean? You don't need it, I think. <laughs> Seriously, I, when I wrote my first book, I, like you, didn't know anyone, I didn't have any uh, agent, I didn't have any contacts in the publishing world. I, uh, I'm afraid I self-published, which is a bit of a vanity thing to do, but I, I did it uh, for my book of, first book of poems called Mappings. And then uh, the book I wrote about hitchhiking across Tibet came as the result of a journey. But there again, I sent it off to lots of publishers and no one wanted to publish it. And then finally, someone did. Um, I wrote The Golden Gate, again, no one, I sent it to about 30 publishers. So there's no obvious way in terms of the publishing world, the ocean that you perhaps are thinking of as the, maybe not the ocean, the jungle, let's say. But the, the ocean is what I call the ocean of inspiration. Now that, uh, like Sursagar, you know, you consider the ocean, um, that is an ocean of inspiration and that's where I think you have to just go by what your feelings are, what your inspirations are, and by being true to your, yourself and your muse, and not letting yourself be influenced by people saying, oh, this will sell, or you shouldn't write that because that's, that'll put you in danger, or it'll be too troublesome. So, but I think you know that, don't you? I mean, if you become a writer at this age, then obviously you're writing from the heart. Thank you so much. Sure. So, good evening, sir. Good evening. I'm Anne, and I'm asking this for the sake of my, cl uh, as in on behalf of my classmates, and yes. for the sake of the sanity of my English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm glad you put it in that order. That's very nice of you. Yes. Be uh, and as a student, especially of ninth grade, we, are, we just started high school, and our writing system says that we give a prompt, except especially for exams. We're given a prompt on the spot. We're supposed to write a uh, story for like 10 marks, which is around half, one and a half pages. So what would your advice be for all the students, especially the students, who want to write a story as soon as they get the uh, plot, as soon as they get the prompt? Because that is very important. <laughs> 10 marks. My, my honest advice, though this will neither help your sanity nor your classmates, is don't. I mean, I couldn't possibly, I mean, I'm not, yes, of course, we're given essay subjects, uh, like a day on the beach, or my favorite holiday, or jam, or uh, shoes, or something. Yes, I mean, I suppose you could write something, but seriously, uh, that's not, that's passing an exam. It's not really to do with, uh, you know, with, with writing that, where you choose the subject, and, and you, uh, you know, set your own bounds and you write something that is worth reading. You know, after all, there, you know, the page, the page, sheet of paper is going to be based anyway. But if you write something that's going to be published, then, then you're going to be killing trees. You know, a very bad thing to do, unless it's worthwhile. Um, of course, now you can read without killing trees, but I like reading books that are physical. Um, so I'm sorry, that, that's a question that's a dud. I, at least it, I can't give you a proper answer to that, despite the fact that everyone here seems to be enthused about your question. Do you have an answer to it? Actually, yes. Let's hear Actually, it. Actually, yes. I just wanted to have a confirmation. My answer, I would, my answer probably would be that just get your idea, just choose the keywords. They will be keywords. And as an example, I got a question that said, uh, for a question as my holiday homework, that told me, like, you wake, up, you wake up one morning, you look at a mirror, and the fa you see a face that's your, not your own. 
And that's the prompt I got from my exam. Also, the same prompt. So what I did, I just took the mirror part, and I, and I remember this might seem a little like a hopefully J.K. Rowling wouldn't mind me copying her idea. I just wrote that about the mirror of Ellison. I think also uh, you've hit upon something that, that didn't strike me when I answered your question, which is that, that prompts are of different qualities. You know, that's quite an intriguing prompt. That is a very intriguing prompt. Because you might see, for example, you might look at your real face in the mirror as you get older. You sometimes think, where did those wrinkles come from? Where's that white hair from? Who is, whose face is that I'm looking uh, at in the mirror? Uh, yes, interesting that. Though actually it's very odd. That particular uh, thought came to me during the... Uh, one of these libretti that I wrote, um, um, my eyes look back at me and say, where were these wrinkles yesterday? Where are the friends you used to know? Where are the oats you used to sow? Who is this stranger, foolish, wise, who stares at you with your own eyes? That it's your eyes. So, uh, Since I'm in this book and um, I've been told that our time is, is limited, I'll apologize to those people whose questions I couldn't answer, but maybe you can ask them during the book signing. But I found that with, uh, with, this, with this thing over here, um, I, I ended up the last time where there were more kids here with one of the poems that I wrote um, called Fire. which is the gnar over there. Um, and since the last poem I read was rather serious, we should, you could sit down now, if you wish. What, what was not, you mean the story you wrote was? No, no, the, uh, mine was good enough. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I think you should give marks to your teachers. <laughs> right. So here, here's, um, here's a poem called uh, Fire, with which we shall yeah, we perhaps have... end. Um, it's a little different from my, my usual poems. Um, I'd written a different poem called Fire uh, earlier, and the composer rejected it. He said, you know, I can't set it to music. So I said, well, I can't write a, another poem called Fire within a month of writing the first one, just because you're not happy with it. Uh, he said, why don't you just have a drink or two and see what comes out? <laughs> so I wrote Fire. Here we are. Fire. Fire. Fire and music. We have. Uh, bring it onto the stage. We can combine fire and music. Okay, maybe not. So here we are. Fire. Fire. Oh, fire. 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 Desire. Hot, hot, hot. I'm burning a lot with desire. Oh, fire. Fire, fire. Hot as a filament wire. Hot as prawn jambalaya. I'm burning so hot. I'm baking a pot. Oh, hot, hot, hot is desire. Fire. Fire. All was born from me. All your eyes can see. Who gave life and birth to sun and star and earth? Who gave pulse and germ to man and beast and worm? Who is hot, hot, hot when black space is not? Who is bright, bright, bright in this endless night? Fire! 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 Oh, fire! 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 Desire! Hot! 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 I'm burning a lot with desire! Oh, fire! 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 Hot as a funeral pyre! Leaping up higher and higher! I sizzle! I daze! I fizzle! I blaze! I scorch! I toast! I flare! I, ro I smolder! I roast! I flare, I excite, I flash, I ignite, I rage, I lust, I blaze, I combust. Red, 
yellow, white. I light up the night, this endless night, with desire. Oh, fire, fire, fire. Well, that's it. Water, yes, water. Good thank you so much, Vikram, for lighting up that fire. And thank you, you've been a wonderful audience. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sure there were so many more questions, but because we are short uh, of time, we have to wrap up the session. And uh, looking forward to more of such interactions, Vikram. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a pleasure to have thank you. Thank you, Ajita. With this, we come to the end of today's discussion. Firstly, we would like to thank our distinguished guest of honor for gracing us with his valuable presence. A big thank you to Mrs. Anjana Shankar for moderating today's thought-provoking discussion. A big thank you to the audience for making time out of their weekends to come and make this evening an enlightening one. We now request our principal, Mrs. Ambika Gulati, to present a token of appreciation to our chief guest. Thank you.